All right, welcome to part 21 of Where Did the Book of Mormon Come From? And we are looking at the Restoration Principle. So, you know, the religious atmosphere of the 1800s was that denominations were pre prevalent throughout America. But, friends, we need to ask some questions. And this is something that's very important that we need to do. Did the Jesus Christ, did he build only one church? You know, Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And we see the Lord did build his church there in Acts chapter 2. And all those who obeyed the conditions, who trusted and obeyed Jesus Christ, who repented and were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins, they were added to the church Praising God, having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved, Acts 2.47. And then you see how throughout the book of Acts, constantly there are being people who are trusting and obeying the same gospel. And we see the letters of Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, all those people there, friends, they're Christians. They are children of God. They obeyed the same gospel. And it's sad when along the way, people got away from the word of God. Now, remember 1 Timothy 4.1 uh, says some will depart from the faith, but not all. And that's something we need to recognize. And ask yourself, were the congregations ever started in the first century? Were they man-made denominations? Think about the seven churches of Asia Minor was Ephesus Methodist, was Smyrna, was it Baptist, was Philadelphia, was it Episcopalian, was, was others Presbyterian, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses, I mean, you name it, friends. And, you know, wouldn't God, don't you think God, who made us in his image, does it, don't you believe he wants us to be part of, that the whole human family, he would want to be part of the one universal church that Jesus established. Did not Jesus in uh, John 17, did he not pray for his disciples? He prayed that they all may be one, Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, and that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, if we show the true unity standing upon the word of God, and that's why we have to interpret the Word of God correctly. And then we see, I mean, honestly, can denominationalism, can you really affirm that that's the right thing we ought to have today? Is it really, I mean, can anyone really honestly say, yeah, I'm thankful for all these divisions that we have? Really? Do we really have that kind of attitude? That is a sorry attitude. And we should strive for true unity on the Word of God. Uh, isn't denominationalism foreign to the New Testament? And certainly, I would say it is, friends, when you look at what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches one universal church. You know, Ephesians 1, 22, 23, the Bible says the church is his body. In Ephesians 4, 4, it says there's one church. Therefore, logically, there's one church, friends. He is the Savior of the body, Jesus, uh, that Paul said. So is it possible to return to the New Testament and uphold the principles that it teaches? Can we go back to what the Bible says about how to become saved, how to be a Christian? Can we see what God wants us to do when it comes to worshiping Him? Can we see what God wants us to do in regards to how He desires the, the, to organize the church? Friend, be, be honest. And I believe that, that we can if we really are honest with ourselves. So here is the argument that I would like to present to you. If the new covenant is greater than the old covenant, and under the old covenant there was falling away that took place, and it was right to return to the Lord in the ways that he established when that covenant was binding, then according to the Afratory principle, the greater than principle, it would be right to return to the Lord and his ways established in the new covenant that is binding today, when falling ways take place under the new covenant age. So look at some of the, what, you know, we look at what the Bible says 
and we are under the new covenant. Second Corinthians three, Hebrews eight makes that clear, friends. We know that there are falling aways. You remember that under the kings, there were certain kings that got away from God, and then there was people like Josiah, who recognized they found the book of the law, and they said we've not been doing what God told us to do, and even Jeremiah says stand and ask for the old paths and walk therein. So friends, if people, if they can fall away in the old, under the old covenant system, and yet they could return to what God taught, and we're under a greater covenant today, then whenever it be the case that we get away from God, can we not go back to God and his ways? Certainly, my friend, certainly. And that shows us the restoration principle is true. So some might make the mistake of believing that we cannot return to the ancient order of things. So let me ask. We know that various congregations were being established in the first century. For example, you see the church in Jerusalem in AD 30 and Acts 2. And we have Samaria receiving the gospel, the very pure seed, several months afterward in Acts 8. Saul became a Christian in Acts 9. We learn, actually learned later that Ananias said to him, he was obviously a believing, he also was penitent, and so and I said to him, Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so he did, and he was washed by the blood of the Lamb. His sins were washed away. Cornelius and his household became Christians in Caesarea about three and a half years after the ch church had started. Paul and Barnabas go on this missionary journey, and they establish various congregations all around in Acts 13 and 14. So what's my point? My point is that they all trusted the same gospel that was taught. And even some, though some years waned, the same seed was planted in good and honest hearts. And the people there became Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch, Acts 11, 26. Even in Jerusalem in AD 30, they became Christians, even though they weren't called Christians just yet. In Corinth, look at there, 20 years later. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase, my friends. Time is not a factor to be considered it's because the word of God is eternal. It's living. It's abiding forever. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25 says. So it abides throughout all future generations. So, you know, I use that example under the old covenant. I mean, friends, you have Manasseh who reigned for 55 years and he was an evil king. Thank God that at the end of his life, he changed. But then his son Ammon was evil. But then Josiah, he was 16 years old when the restoration started to occur. So he was eight years old when he began to reign. But eight years later into his reign, he found the book of the law. And there was, a, so to speak, a restoration movement. And that was 73 years. I mean, the, you know, the word of God does not change. So our next argument is the seed principle. And if every seed produces after its kind, and the seed is the word of God, and God's word, and only God's word, not mixed with man-made error, can produce plants after its own kind, Christians, and the soil represents the different types of hearts that will receive or not receive the word, and the Father will uproot every plant that he did not plant, then a person must sow the pure seed into his or her heart in order to become a Christian. Friend, on day three, God made everything after its own kind. Uh, God made the trees, and he made the fruit. And you know that an apple tree will produce apples. You know that an orange tree will produce oranges. The seed is the word of God. It's what Jesus said in Luke 8, 11. We know that God's word can produce plants after its own kind. We know it lives and abides forever. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And the soil represents the different kinds of hearts that will receive or not receive the word, as we see in the in the sower, in the parable of the sower. And the Father will uproot every plant that he did not plant. Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. And so, friends, you must sow the pure seed of the word of God in your heart in order to become a Christian. So my point is, it's noble to want to go back, restore principles that are found in the word of God. And that's what you go seeing in the American Restoration Movement. These men like Campbell and Stone and Scott, and even though they're very flawed, very flawed men, they had the, certainly the right concept. Let's return to the Scriptures. Let's return to the Bible. 
I don't have to go to what Alexander Campbell said. I don't have to go to the Christian Baptist. I don't have to go to the um, Millennial Harbinger. I can go to the Bible, my friends. Really, that's all you need. And that's all we have to do. I think what James E. Bell wrote was is very good. He said, The restoration principle maintains that we must plant the first century truth in today's world in order to establish New Testament churches. The Reformation principle, interpreted by some, maintains that we need not and cannot go back to the primitive church of the first century, but that when wherein an apostate church exists today, the need is to reform it and not to restore New Testament congregations. The doctrine of continuous revelation maintains, I'm sorry for misspelling that, that one cannot have the New Testament church unless the miraculous gifts and continuous revelation are restored in the church today. And this is exactly what the Mormon church is, my friends. That's the principle they believe in. This position maintains that one must restore certain things revealed in the first century, but the final authority is to be found in the modern revelations of the Spirit, in which they today believe they have a modern-day prophet. Of course, if there are inspired men today, their word would be as authoritative as the New Testament. Okay. I like what Holly, he, he had some good things to say. He says, our first assumption is that God has revealed himself to man. And that's true. Second, we assume that God's revelation is made known to man through Jesus Christ. Third, Christians are bound by the authority of Christ in their faith and practice. Fourth, the Bible, written, though written by man, is a divine document inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Fifth, the New Testament is the sole expression of spiritual authority for Christians today. Sixth, primitive Christianity is a model for times to come. Seventh, the church is, is or has been apostate. Our final assumption relates to the restoration principle is that human beings are capable of understanding the Bible alike. And that's very true. So has God revealed himself to mankind? You know, sadly, an agnostic and an atheist would say no to that. But, you know, most of us who hold to the Christian worldview, we believe God has revealed himself in nature, but also he's revealed himself through a book in which that book actually gives us evidence, my friends, that it is inspired of God, the Bible. And I wish I, I don't have the time to talk about that because that's not what this is about. But he has shown us sufficient evidence for existence, and we think about the family of arguments, known as design arguments, the cosmological arguments, the moral arguments. So that's something for us to think about. So the Word of God, the Bible, contains evidence that is beyond mere human production. And if that's the case, then it is the Word of God. And I would say that with regards to the prophecies are found in it with the specific timing and the details of the fulfillment of it and of 100 the unity of the bible and we could talk more about that but that's that's not my i'm not trying to uh you know i could talk about christian evidences but i it's important that we talk about other things um another thing to think about is that God has revealed through his son, Jesus of Nazareth, and that he did miracles, he fulfilled prophecies, and God the Father told us to listen to his son. His son sent the Holy Spirit who guided the apostles into all truth. Now, that's very important, friends. All the truth was revealed to us in the first century, and that's how you can know that the Book of Mormon is not from God. The Holy Spirit worked through these inspired messengers and authenticated their message by miracles. God claimed that he gave us the word, but he also authenticated it through evidence. We accept by faith based on the evidence that's inspired of God. The New Testament is the covenant that all men are under today and are expected to follow. This may seem shocking to some, but it's very clear from the New Testament itself. And I would invite you to read all of those scriptures there that we are under today, that we are under. Christianity is a model that can be taught in the future generations. The Bible clearly teaches in the first century there were future predictions of those who would turn and depart from the faith. And you can read about what Paul said to the Ephesian elders, so, that some would be led away, some would be some would be savage wolves that would come among the flock. We see that while it could be argued as to when these may have may occur, it is certain that it teaches it as a fact that it would occur. So was 
So the question we might ask ourselves is, was there a total apostasy or was it partial? Did it happen in spurious places across the timeline? Well, as 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, some will depart from the faith. So it's something that is partial. As you can see here, now the Spirit especially says, some will depart from the faith. Give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, if someone can depart from the faith, can they return to the faith? And certainly that is true, my friends. And if they can come back to the faith, it is reasonable to conclude that God is some kind of standard or measurement by which we can ascertain such an objective standard? Certainly. In the Bible, and from the Bible that God wants us as his human creatures to understand his word alike. Let's think about the nature of God for a moment, friends, and how this fits in with what we, we're talking about in regards to the restoration principle. See, we need to understand the nature of God, who God is, and what he's like. And Malachi reveals that God is changeless. And so does the writer of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God is not changed, and the nature of man is not changed, it is evident there's no need for truth to change because, uh, you know, truth relative to man's salvation. So this changeless God works today as he once did. He, he gave us the word of God. He gave mar miracles to confirm that word. And once the word was fully revealed, then there's no longer necessary the need for miracles. It is true that God is now operating through what's known as the new covenant. And he's the same God who is gracious, merciful, kind, just, who always speaks the truth in love and always keeps his promises. And the nature of both God and the Old Testament are important matters that help the Christian to understand the attitude that God has toward apostasy. In addition, the need to return to God is also evident from the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament serves as a record that is as examples to us, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11. The Old Testament serves as a, also as a negative example of what we're not supposed to do. So the Old Testament also serves as a positive example of what to do. By faith, we are to walk by faith. Now, we might not do the specific activities like building an ark, but we are to walk by faith. And we see that the logical conclusion is that we are to do the things that are pleasing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a reward of those who dil diligently seek him. So we are to please God today by showing our faith, showing our love, showing our obedience, my friends. So this, uh, this applies to all things not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Old Testament serves to teach us. And the things that happen to those Old Testament people serve as examples to us and to admonish us. So think about how there was the institution and from and departure from pure religion in the Old Testament. Remember that the law of Moses did come from God. It was a divine system. When God instituted the law of Moses, it was a pure religion. But God prophesied of an apostasy and departure from it. In fact, Moses revealed the pure religion of God there at Mount Sinai. God cursed the Israelites as they changed the word of God. God prophesied their departure from the word of God in Deuteronomy 31. He informed them that they would be punished for their departure from his word. The first example we see, uh, the, uh, many examples, but I want to mention just some. We can see in the book of Judges. Notice how they depart from God, from the will of God as soon as their leaders, good leaders die. And unfortunately, because of this departure, God was forced to punish them by withdrawing his protection. And they begin to suffer. They cry out to God. They desire to repent. God forgives them. But yet, they go back into the same cycle over and over and over again. Second example is from Hezekiah's day. The departure was realized, but their good king brought them back to the will of God. And when Judah returned to God, he forgave them and they received his blessings. Notice the reaction of God to their return. The third example is from the days of King Josiah. Again, the people go into apostasy. And while Josiah was a very good king, the people did not return to God with all their heart. And his restoration was sadly ineffective. And their return was only half-hearted, and God's reaction to their half-hearted return was to punish them. The fourth example is right from the days after the return from the Babylonian captivity, where Nehemiah gives an account of their numerous apostasies, and their departure was from the truth, and they must return to it in order to please God. And when they return, we see the reaction of a merciful God. So this pure system was a design to end and to be replaced by a better covenant. However, a failure to obey the first covenant brought punishment. Well, what about uh, when we're thinking about a greater covenant, a newer covenant, a, a new covenant, friends? It brings about even, even greater responsibility, right? 
So the Israelites were first obedient, and then they rebelled against God, and then they cast the law of God behind their backs, and they slew the prophets. The prophets had worked to turn them again to God and to bring them again to God's law. When God speaks, he does not want his will to change in any manner. And when men change his will, either by perverting the doctrine, substituting a different doctrine, keeping the people in ignorance of his will, we'll be punished for, and because we are to keep and to teach the word of God. We're to be a good steward of God's word. When he punished them, then they repented and returned to his will, were converted. He was merciful and forgave them. There are many people who would try to make fun of people who believe that someone cannot go back to the Bible to see what it says. But God throughout human history is well pleased with those under the old covenant who sought to stand in the old paths. So let's think about this. If God is an unchangeable being, and he is, the old covenant serves as an example for Christians, and it does. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant, and it is. And God is an unchangeable being, and under the old covenant there were falling ways that took place. And it was right to return to the Lord in his ways. They established when the co- that covenant was binding. Then how much greater, friends, when we're living under the new covenant today? Think about that, my friends. Now, we think about that God is an unchangeable being. The nature of God in the Old Testament are important matters that help the Christian understand the attitude of God toward apostasy. God is a changeless being. For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O son of Jacob. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. There were falling away that took place during the time of the Old Covenant that was amenable to the Jews. It was right to return to the Lord in his ways that he established when the Old Covenant was binding. The Old Co- Testament record serves as an example for us. The Old Testament serves as a negative example of what not to do and as, as a positive example of what to do. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. And we know that God is pleased with people who have love, people who have faith, people who want desire to obey his will. So God has revealed the law through the prophet Moses and there were curses for changing the word of God. And we see the offertory principle. It's a sound principle found in the word of God, my friends. We know that Jesus used it. If, if A is greater than B, something is true for B, then it's true for A. I mean, we think about how Jesus used this in the Sermon on the Mount. And he demonstrates the futility of anxiety over food and drink. He uses the futility of worry over our stature, futility of worrying over our clothing, to prove that he could heal on the Sabbath, to prove that the Jews were wrong in several of their traditions. He used that, my friends. And since God was pleased with people returning to his ways under the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant is greater than the Old Covenant, then God would be pleased with those who return to him and his ways established in the New Covenant that is binding today when falling ways take place that's under the New Covenant. Let me show you an example of this, friends. It's very easy. Do you know we've gotten away from the organization of the, Lord, of the Lord's church? You know, it's sad to me what you, what you can see from the Bible. You can see for every single congregation of the Lord's church, they had a plurality of qualified males who, who are Christians. And we see that they fulfill the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. They were called bishops, but they were also called elders. They were called pastors. All, all those refer to the same work, my friends. And I have a video on that, and you can watch that. But sadly, what happened was they started putting one bishop over the elders, so to speak. And then that led to, of course, what we know as the Roman Catholic Church model of having a pope. And that's not found in the Word of God, my friends. That's apostasy. That's getting away from the Word of God. And we need to seek to go back to what God's Word teaches. So I hope that that has been very helpful to you. And, um, you know, there's a lot more to learn. And there's a lot more to do. And I really appreciate you all listening. You've been very attentive, very thankful. And we're going to look at um, next how Alexander Campbell met Sidney Rigdon. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much.